Hello, my name is Laura Wade and I am Head of Sustainability at Essence, which is a full service media agency specialising in data and digital. So this talk today is about how and why the industry needs to evolve to be relevant and welcomed in a net zero society or we risk becoming extinct. We risk becoming so deeply entrenched in a carbon heavy lifestyle and a carbon heavy behaviour that we are no longer relevant and no longer invited into a net zero society, which will mean we are dinosaurs. I'm very conscious that I've already dropped a piece of jargon on you with net zero. So, let's do it. This is a bit of participation, sorry guys. Uh, raise your hands if you know confidently how to define net zero. Okay, uh, raise your hands if you know why 1.5 degrees is the target for us to stay beneath. Okay, so as a group, if we're reflective of our industry, this is common parlance. We should all know what this means. This, you know, I'd say about a tenth of us know what this means. Net zero, not to be mistaken with carbon neutral, net zero is the absolute reduction of your emissions by about 90%, with only 10% of your residual emissions being offset or carbon captured. The 1.5 degree target. So this is the biggie. The reason why this is so important is past this point, we go past the point of no return. This is where tipping points kick in. We lose any control of chlorine back our temperature or extreme conditions, and we face a series of catastrophic events. So we really need to stay at under or beneath 1.5 degrees. And I can't reiterate that enough. And just as in COP26, they said, we have only just kept 1.5 alive, and it's going to take all our actions now and at scale to keep it alive. But I'm going to talk about me now. Um, I joined the industry back in 2002. I'm one of those rare people that actually did a degree in advertising and marketing. Um, when I joined the industry, I loved it. It was full of passionate people, creative, innovative people. My, uh, MySpace and LinkedIn had just launched. It was two years before Facebook launched and four before Twitter launched. Digital advertising was new, but it was growing. And there was a whopping 197 million pounds spent on online advertising. It felt like a very exciting place to be. I had no idea what was going on in the climate, but it was the second warmest year uh, the second warmest year on global, in global history with an average temperature increase of 0.5 degrees. Also, just again, giving you a bit of a climate science education here, over a millennia, we have never exceeded 300, 000, uh, 300 parts per million of carbon in our atmosphere. In 2022, we were at 370 and rising. Jump forward 20 years. I am now in a head of sustainability role, and the industry and the impact that we're having is still very much celebrated. I used to be very proud to be able to say when I worked in sponsorship to my family and friends, that's the partnership I did, that's the TV sponsorship, or that's the experience I created. And for our clients, it was very much about, we thank you for putting your trust in us, we've grown your brand, we've, we've shifted perception, and we've helped you grow sales. In 2022, however, we're having a different dialogue, as you can see from some of these images. Our online advertising spend in the UK back in 2021 uh, was 22.5 billion. So the, our industry has exploded. It's huge. Twitter is in the process of being bought for 44 billion. This didn't exist in 2002. But probably more starkly are the climate stats. No longer is our industry being scrutinised by marketing directors and brand managers, but instead policymakers, leaders and climate scientists. And the reason being is that for the, we've had the 10th most consecutive warmest years on the planet since records began. We're now at 1.1, guys, so we're really edging close to 1.5. And even this morning on the radio, they were talking about how excited they were that it was going to be the hottest July ever on record in the UK. Now. That might feel brilliant for us, but if you are in Delhi, you've just experienced five heat waves this year reaching 49 degrees. They're gonna to get to the point in Delhi where if you are out exposed in the sunshine for more than six hours, a healthy adult will die. So this is gonna be a shock to our system when we start to see the 200 million people that are expected to immigrate because of climate catastrophes. Also in May 
2022, we peaked at 419 parts per million of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And again, when you hear people talking about a carbon budget, a carbon budget is based on these numbers. And that's why we know we must not exceed 450 parts per million. Because again, we hit the 1.5 mark, we go into tipping points, and it's a catastrophe. We really are playing Russian roulette at the moment, and we need to wake up and realize this. Now, for those of you that haven't heard of the Purpose Disruptors, I would recommend that you get involved because they are an activist group within our industry that provide lots of useful resources, including this graph. Because we have, as an industry, sort of sidestepped the climate issue quite significantly. However, now it is evident that the more ads you see, the more CO2 you create. Here is a graph that shows the correlation per capita of CO2 produced emissions and advertising spend. We are definitely in the space of polluters, not solvers at the moment. Also, <laughs> I feel like I'm on my soapbox at the moment. Um, right, so this isn't a trend. This isn't going to be something that we're going to answer in the next year with green PMPs or new products that we can sell and continue to grow our industry with. This is happening. As our industry grows, climate and policy makers and leaders are slashing budgets, uh, carbon budgets. The UK government has committed to a 78% reduction in carbon by 2035, and in the EU, this is a 55% reduction by 2030. 16% of that target will only be met with consumer behaviour change in the sources, the Climate uh, Committee uh, Charter. And if none of that compels you, if you're of a commercial mind, 90% of the global GDP is covered by net zero commitments. So our industry needs to transform, and it needs to transform quickly. The context we operate in has changed, and has anyone noticed? I don't know how many other talks you've been to today, but really sustainability needs not to be a topic on its own. It needs to be embedded throughout everything we talk about as an industry. And the reason is, I think we can do it. We have the skills and the passion within our industry to tackle this and solve this. We've got bright minds. But now we need to add a bit of pride in the work that we do. Our industry has been impacted by the Great Resignation quite significantly with a 30% advertising churn. How do we get the talent and attract and retain talent within our industry? Well, 72% of Generation Z said they would not work for a company that does not have a rec good record on sustainability. And you can see the UN General Secretary here at the cl class of 2022 saying categorically, do not work with climate wreckers. Are we climate wreckers? But even if, if it's not about attracting new talent, the existing talent within our industry say that 71% of them want their agency to take climate action. So we know that we need to change and we know that we've got the desire to do so. Sustainability is and will be as transformational as digital. So we need to take advantage of that and get on board. Now I know at the beginning I sort of threw a lot of stats and facts and negative uh, imagery in front of you, but can you imagine how helpless we would feel if there was nothing we could do about the climate crisis? If we knew, well, we, the Arctic's lost. It's irreversible, the melting now for the Arctic. You know, there, there's, there's cat you know, climate events are going to happen more rapidly in our lifetime. This isn't about our children, this is about our lifetime. We are going to experience this ourselves. But we are at a point where we can decide how much loss and suffering we're willing to tolerate. And we can do something about it. We can take action. So, um, what impact can you have now? As an industry, there are pockets of hope and ambition. So, the first thing to say is if you work in production or creative, you need to be engaging in stuff like AdGreen. So, AdGreen is a free service, it's free training on how to decarbonize your production. It also offers a carbon calculator for your production. Work with companies like Seen This. So, we work with Seen This and we've worked with them for many years. Over the last uh, sort of six to 12 months, what we have been working with them on is the fact that streaming versus downloading digital formats reduces your carbon footprint quite significantly without impacting the quality of your creative. And to the point where we've seen sometimes up to 80% reduction in the carbon that is associated with the creative. 
And then you have offerings like Hogarth Sustainably Made, where they're looking at recycling imagery and using imagery from previous shoots, uh, rather than going out and doing carbon-heavy uh, new shoots. So again, think about how your business engages with production within this space and how you can potentially shift the dial. This is all about decarbonizing production. Then we move into the placement and publisher space. I think many of you were at the, um, the talk just now and it had Scope 3 on it. So what Scope 3 are doing in a nutshell with big data is helping us measure the carbon down to impression level. So this is really going to be useful for us to understanding within the supply chain where there is data waste and where there is data excess. And that's something as a motto at Essence we are doing when we look across our processes at the moment to see how we can refine them. Also, if you're in the publisher space, you're probably aware of new properties such as We Are Right popping up. So We Are Right are a disruptor brand. They're trying to change the social community where they pay, you get paid for watching a full, full ad, full video ad, and you can then pay that uh, money forward. So for the placement and publisher space, it's measurement and decarbonisation, but also changing the status quo. And then when it comes to planning departments and agencies, we have the carbon calculator, and there's many carbon ca calculators out there. The big thing I would say, take away from this, is we need to galvanize around a carbon calculator across the whole industry. There's no point having individual carbon calculators, because that defeats the point. And if we're going to tackle sustainability, we need to do it together. This is all about collaboration. If one succeeds, we all succeed. But if someone doesn't come on this journey with us, then we will fail as an industry. Then there's the Change the Brief Alliance, again, out of our lovely people at Purpose Disruptors. And this is a brief, um, this is a fantastic resource for agency folk in terms of how they tackle the brief that they've been set by clients and make it more sustainable. And finally, advertised emissions. Now this is a bit of a game changer. This is something that I'm working on as a cohort. Um, and to this point, it's been pretty much theoretical. However, the UN had just adopted advertised emissions within the Race to Zero framework, which means now every advertising agency and media agency will become responsible for the emissions that they drive with the sales of products that they uh, deliver through their campaigns. This is going to shift the dial in terms of accountability and the types of work we do for clients. So this is very much about changing the output, driving more sustainable behaviours and being more accountable. So this is everything we can do now. This is all at our fingertips. If you are doing business as usual and you're not embracing any of these, do it tomorrow. <laughs> Don't wait a week, just start doing it. But we need to address the elephant in the room. How do we contribute to a four ton lifestyle? Because that's where we need to get to. In the UK, we are averaging at 12.7 tons per person, which is pretty hefty. When you look at the average carbon footprint in Malawi, they have 0.2 tonnes of CO2 per person. And this is obviously where a just transition and equitable values are key to anything that we implement. Because we need to give de developing countries an economic empowerment in terms of increasing their tonnage per person. But we need to drastically reduce ours. And I mean, the average carbon footprint in North America is 21 tonnes, which is pretty shocking. Because at the moment, how we're behaving is going only in one direction. But how do we as an advertising industry address this challenge and create an industry that supports a four-ton lifestyle? A wise man once said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. And that is true. I think sometimes we try and come up with solutions with all the parameters that we've had before around us. And we think, well, how does that fit with what we already do? Or how does that meet the metrics that we need to deliver against? We need to collaborate and we need to be brave and we need to challenge the status quo. So I've got five provocations here, bear with me. I hope they might um, spark some thoughts or spark some actions. And also, are there any provocations? You can challenge me on this. I think we are losing our way trying to define a conscious consumer. I've seen many a deck from publishers talking about how 63% of consumers now want to buy more ethically or more environmentally friendly. Whereas when you look at this chart from Kantar, which was a global study, a very robust one, look at this bottom right here. So these are considerers and these are dismissers. So 78% of the consumer population either don't believe in it or consider buying sustainably but don't follow through. So 
with the considerers, they have one of the biggest intent and action, uh, yeah, intent and action gaps of around 43%. So if you start creating a sustainability campaign, you're going to talk to a small percentage of these people and you are going to miss a massive opportunity. Massive opportunity for growth and a massive opportunity for impact. Um, what we need to start doing is thinking about how can we reach people where they are? How can we create campaigns that deliver for the people that don't believe or don't know how to or are swung by price and convenience rather than sustainability? This benefits us in two ways. When you start understanding your audience and how you can meet them where they are, you start looking at potentially at, okay, is job security going to be what shifts the dial for that audience? Or is protecting nature? Or is social justice? Or plain old frugality, money saving? But we should be helping them where they are to adopt more sustainable behaviours. It also helps us to avoid lazy stereotypes of white middle class women with tote bags being eco-warriors because we need everyone to come on this journey. We need to be inclusive. Sustainability is about inclusivity and we need to democratise it. So I would recommend that we no longer talk about conscious consumers. We no longer target ethical consumers. We just target the people that we need to reach in a way that works for them and helps them have a more sustainable lifestyle even if they don't know it. So sustainability by stealth. Okay, so again, this is a problem shared, create shared value. So shared value is a business model that I would highly recommend. It's a, share, it's a model where you drive business competitiveness, but you also have a positive impact on the economic and social, um, uh, economic and social impact of the communities that you operate in. And these are two examples that I'm sure many of you have seen off the back of cans recently. So the first one is Michelob Ultra. So Michelob Ultra on organic beer. And they have massive growth targets. They, they can see significant demand and they want to grow as a brand. However, 1% of US farmers are organic, and which is why they created Contract for Change. Contract for Change addresses three barriers to becoming organic farmers. So the first one was that they didn't have the know-how. So they've partnered with uh, certification bodies, resources to help those farmers understand how they transition. The second one was that when you move to organic, it takes you three years and you also have an impact on your yield. So what they've done is they've guaranteed um, financial support of up to 25% to buy those products that are non-organic, but also to cover the loss of yield that they're going to face. I think I've covered both points in my, third, in my second point, but um, yeah, oh, no, that's not. And the third point was that obviously security. So what Michelob have done is they've guaranteed that they will purchase from these farmers for an extended period of time, giving them financial security. So not only have they addressed a problem in their supply chain, they've created resilience and they've grown a category that is better for the planet and better for them. And then Sheba Hope. Again, if we get to 1.5 degrees, and spoiler alert, we're on track for about 2.4 degree warming at the moment, we lose 90 to 95% of coral. We've already got about 800 dead zones in the ocean as well, so the ocean is on its knees. So Sheba know this, and 40% of their fish, 40% well, of their protein comes from fish. So therefore, they needed to address the health of our ocean and set about working with the UN and WWF to create a uh, restora reef restoration project off the coast of Indonesia. Now, the social impact of this is that islanders, island communities obviously su survive on the ocean and survive on the fish supplies. They were able to give economic empowerment and employ Indonesians to work on this project, but they've also made sure that that community also has a healthy ocean to supply them with fish for generations to come. So this solves a problem for Sheba, in the sense of they need a, to restore reefs to have healthy oceans and healthy fish uh, for their future products. But they've also managed to help uh, the local island communities as well to secure their future and, and bring back their reefs, which were, I think they were under 10%. They'd, they'd been decimated and now three years later, they're at 60% life, uh, sort of marine life, which is fantastic. So, this is an example of enlightened self-interest. 
which is what we all need to embrace, really. Um, we can come up with solutions, fix, solve, solu solve problems with solutions that not only work for us, but work for the communities and the planet that we live on. So this is probably not the easiest one, but probably the one that you can identify how you can do this quickly. We need to start create, crafting cultural norms. We need to move away from, and we need to decouple carbon-heavy lifestyles with signals of success. And we need to start thinking about how do we make less stuff, more joy, our mantra. And I know that's a really awkward thing to say when we talk about growth, but we need to stop buying as much. Excessive consumption is a problem. We need a 70% reduction of lifestyle emissions in the UK, so we need to stop buying and consuming so much stuff. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. So we can do this um, through changing the images, changing the content that we endorse or align with. We can do this by making sure that when we run promotions, the type of prizes reflect um, sustainable values. It's worth noting, and this is a random fact, that apparently Gen Z, over half of Gen Z would rather do grow your own than go to a nightclub. So I don't know if that's something to do with the quality of nightclubs these days, but it, you know, people have interests beyond having Rolexes, and jumping on planes. We need to normalise that and we need to celebrate that and make those behaviours aspirational. This is probably the biggest point. I don't have answers to these, by the way. They are provocations. But we, the right to repair legislation has kicked in in the UK. And we're seeing products like Fairphone, which is a phone that lasts for eight to ten years, that you can deconstruct and refurbish. So think about it, if you can resell your product via, here's a Patagonia example, your, the website, if your product lasts 10 years and you can refurbish it at home, do you need to buy anything else? Or do you need to buy it in the first place? Can you rent it or lease it for that period of time? So we're gonna get to a point where brand products are gonna become services. It's gonna be more about your aftercare and your relationship with customers post them leasing or purchasing that product. And what does that mean for marketing? Does that mean that we will know, we'll have a much shorter window of opportunity to influence people and in their product choice? Also means that there's a massive opportunity for brands out there that can create meaningful relationships. The first one in their category to help create a service and a meaningful relationship that means that people go back to them again and again and again will be vital. But I just think this is gonna be an interesting um, play out over the next couple of years in terms of the role for marketing because as marketers and as agencies what are the services that we offer and what are our metrics for success if it's no longer going to be sales and the last one embed sustainability throughout your whole business um, so for me this feels like an absolute no-brainer sustainability isn't a work stream sustainability needs to th thread throughout your whole business and um, there's a couple of examples of here why. Um, E-commerce is booming, so you might go, ah, oh, e-commerce, uh, you know, sustainable web design, brilliant, um, but you're still encouraging people to buy stuff. Um, but look into, there's loads of stats out there around how to build a sustainable website, but also loads of stats around how to reduce returns. By having virtual dressing rooms, for example, reduces returns by up to 35%. And as most returns end up in landfill, that's a big impact that you can have right there. So it's not about having a sustainability team or a sustainability work stream. It's about thinking the products that you are designing or building and making sure sustainability is embedded in its heart. Uh, Meta first. <laughs> I wasn't gonna do a presentation without mentioning it once. Um, look, the metaverse and the, the um, proof of work and the infrastructure behind it is so energy intensive. It doesn't mean we don't embrace it because Deliveroo is energy intensive. Actually, we need to be thinking about all the activations we do and how energy intensive they are. But what we do need to be doing is before we rush into something like the metaverse and create activations, we need to be thinking about what are the alternatives? What are the sustainability values that we are going to adopt before we embrace an activation? Ladby will do this. Ladbible won't launch a commercial NFT until clean NFTs have been uh, significantly improved. And this is an example of a clean NFT. And actually, 
this is an this is an analysis example, so I might get told off by marketing because <laughs> of what I'm about to say. Um, so this is a out of home uh, piece of work that we did in 2021 with Puretti spray, which enables out of home uh, banners to absorb the carbon in the atmosphere. So it actually uh, reduces the carbon in that area, which is amazing for high polluted areas, particularly in city centres. We've done it once. <laughs> we could do it on every piece of out of home that we do. And that's why we've got to start thinking about sustainability as embedding it across all our products, not as a one-off stunt. Sorry, but you know, we're all on this journey. We're not perfect. And this is why we need to share and we need to collaborate so we get to a better place. So really, my provocations hopefully will get you thinking, when it comes to audiences, is what we are creating or delivering, is it reducing our lifestyle emissions? Are we solving a problem for more than just ourselves? The societal value of brands is going to be so important going forward. I can't emphasize this enough. I've realized this terrible formatting because this wasn't here when I uploaded it, Never mind. Are we redefining cultural norms or are we still saying, Success is owning five Rolexes and going on five holidays, long haul. What does transformation really look like? Genuinely, if we, if we need to be living four ton car carbon lifestyles, what does transformation really look like? It's not about just decarbonizing your media plan, which is brilliant, and that's where we need to get to in the next 12 months, and we should be going hell for leather to do that. But the conversation we need to be having is more about what does a real transformation of our industry look like? And another question is, have we embedded sustainability through everything we do? Easy, right? So I'm just going to share with you, I've only been in my role six months. <laughs> so winging it. Um, so what I've learned in the last six months, I'm going to share with you now. You need a simple framework for people to lean into. This is the essence framework. So we've got operations, the way we run our business, media output, the media we plan and place, and influence, shaping our clients' thinking and the partners that we work with. Uh, the way we run our business. So this is our buildings, travel, IT systems, our people. This is where I've started at Essence because actually what you need is to make sure that everybody in the business gets why they're doing extra work to solve this problem. We've had Climate 101 training and uh, we run climate action sessions, which are a safe space for people to come and talk about what the challenges are in their roles and what some of the solutions could be, or if they're just feeling a bit awkward about working in advertising. The media we plan and place, just to correct the panelist from uh, the last uh, talk. So WPP have identified that we have a 98.2% of, uh, of our emissions are scope three, so not operations but actually the media we plan and place, and then, well, within that, the media we plan and place is 55% of that, not digital or media. So this is a significant chunk for us, and this is where we're focusing on our product development at the moment. So the work that we create, the recommendations, and the suppliers we work with, because yes, we have committed to net zero media plans by 2030, which means our supply chain has to be net zero for us to be spending with them in 2030. So we are taking this challenge seriously. We don't know how we're gonna get there, and that is the beauty of sustainability goals. You need to set them before you know how to get there, because otherwise, you kind of, you're not stretching yourself. And then influence, the behaviors we celebrate and normalize. So again, we're part of the Change the Brief Alliance. And, and whilst we have the most control here, of operations, this is going to be the thing that has the biggest impact, and we're very much aware of that. Um, so it's exhausting, right? So the climate crisis is overwhelming. So I either scare people or they switch off when I talk to them. It's also the sort of thing where you sit in a room and everyone nods, yes, we want to save the planet. We want to, yes, we don't want any more heat waves, yes. And then they go out and they do exactly what they've done for the last five years, 10 years of their career, and you want to shoot yourself in the face. Um, and you're like, this is really important. We need to change now. Not, don't wait for me to design a new programmatic product, which we are, but you could be doing this in your day-to-day -day role, in the conversations you have with your clients, the work, the challenges you have around briefs. So yeah, it, it's been exhausting, but I would say everyone needs to be having these conversations. And you know what? It is just about asking the questions. You don't have to have the answer, but you just need to ask. So how is this going to fit with our net zero target? And if you don't have a net zero target, ask why. And be passionate, not a zealot. I've actually said this on stage. <laughs> but um, 
again, people don't react to shame and fear and guilt because it, it freezes us, it paralyzes us and it stops us and we like, Ugh. what people get excited about is the future that we want. And that is something that we can control. We can, you know, we are so powerful, which is why 16% of our, our UK's reduction is gonna come from consumer behavior. That's a direct challenge to this industry to step up and deliver that. And um, final thoughts from me. It took 60 million years to make carbon that we then spent 200 years burning, which worth noting, Eunice Foot, female scientist in the 1800s pointed out, but everyone ignored her. And then we've got eight years to halve these global emissions. Eight years to halve global emissions. We, we need to do this, we need to do it. So, Amelia Earhart said, the most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. So I urge you all to embrace the tenacity and make it happen. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions? If you raise your hands, then we will be running around quickly. I've got a question over here, and then I've got one for you as well, Laura. Hi. Um, so marketing is obviously a driver of consumption. How do you think, because that's obviously a big elephant in boardrooms and stuff that people aren't willing to address, how do you think marketeers and advertisers can balance um, that by also reducing reductions and, uh, yeah? Yeah. Um, look, I, at the moment, I think marketing can have such a positive impact on a business's bottom line in the terms of attracting the right shareholders, um, attracting more customers. Um, I think the role isn't that marketing, I think we just need to think about how are we using marketing? Are we using it to drive consumption or are we communicating what our brand's role is in society and how it adds value to society and start to thinking, thinking more about it's less about saying, this is what I do and what I stand for. It's more about, how do I serve you? Why do I deserve to be using the energy that could be heating houses? <laughs> that could be, you know, you have to have a role that you're going to play in society. It doesn't have to be a worthy one, um, but you, you need to have a clearly defined role. And at the moment, we're not there. So any brand that actually does, like people talk about Patagonia, but any brand that does step up is going to reap the rewards from growth anyway. So at the moment, the short-term opportunity is massive growth, <laughs> I would say. We'll get to the trickier problem of mass consumption in a few years' time. <laughs> okay, we've got another question here. I'm getting me exercise today. This is running off my machine. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, within our industry, we like to be able to standardise a lot of things and have processes and protocols. Well, there's two questions here. Are you speaking to any industry bodies, or why do you think, with this being such an important thing to do in such a short period of time, that the industry bodies are not standardising something or creating a framework for everyone to align to? Um, yes, we are. Yes. So I am on the IPA Climate Charter, and um, obviously, Ad Association have the Ad Net Zero. I think. We've just been a bit slow to act. I think over the next year, what will happen is with products like Scope 3, but also um, the carbon calculator and multiple carbon calculators coming out, I think we're going to be, be at a point where people go, this is bonkers, we can't have 10 different carbon calculators and asking for different data sets. So we'll galvanize around a carbon calculator. Um, obviously, Group M have done a lot of work on that and getting that standardized to align with the greenhouse gas protocol. So it's robust for our supply chain not only across digital, but all media channels. So that'll be really important. Um, and I think, obviously, the work that Scope 3 and Brian are doing, um, enabling us to see the impact of ad tech and, and sloppy sort of ecosystem management within the programmatic space will be, give us the ammunition to make changes. But I think we're still at a discovery stage. We're still learning and we're still understanding what does a benchmark look like? What does standardization look like? And, you know, we all need to go on this journey, so it has to be fair and all players have to contribute. And I think at the moment, lots of things are being developed in parallel, but I hope that's going to come to a head in the next six to 12 months. It's definitely something that I'm pushing for. We've got another question over here. Here we go. Hi there. Um, what, how did you go about getting 
a role of head of sustainability signed off at Essence and, and, and what advice would you give to agencies that perhaps aren't big enough or quite there yet to have a full-time role yeah. ensure that, that they can drive change? Yeah definitely and look I so I mean, be, I had a bit of an epiphany back in uh, on the Christmas break in 2001 because I was like, what am I doing? I've done 20 years in media. Where am I going? What am I doing? And I spent a lot of time thinking about what I was passionate about when I was a child. And I used to go on environmental marches back in the 80s, ban the CFCs. Um, and I felt like this was a route for me to go down. So I made a business case. I went in. I took it to my boss at the time. And she said, I can't see how this fits with our business. And I can't see how we could invest. I actually took... I said, I'd like to go to Cambridge and do this course in sustainability leadership. Um, and she was like, we're not going to invest in that. We don't have training budget. So I ignored her. And I went and saw the COO, the global CEO, and made a business pitch to him. And he said, this is a great idea. I'm going to invest in this. And then for the first year, it was my side hustle. But what became really evident is that um, when you build a business case around commercial shareholders and the change that's coming, attack, attracting and retaining talent, which is a major challenge in our industry, what became evident is that I couldn't do it as a side hustle. And over a year, it kind of just got to the point where it was like, we need to make this full time um, so that you can make this happen. But what, what I would say is that the biggest part of my role is trying to inspire and catalyze everyone else. We need to, we need to make sustainability to democratize. We need everyone in the business to be thinking, okay, if this decision means this, what does that mean for our net zero target? We need to understand the value of carbon the same we understand the value of like a five pound note or a 10 pound note. And that's where we need to get to over the next 12 months. Hopefully that's useful. Laura, thank you very much. That is outstanding.